Thank you for joining us on the Painting Best Practice. Uh, we're going to be interviewing James Robinson talk, and uh, talking about uh, his school, the Art Academy of St. Paul. Uh, before I begin with, uh, with Jim, and also Fina will be joining us too. Um, before we begin, I'm going to, um, we'll, we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about painting best practice. Sorry, a little technical difficulty there. Um, we had, we're going to talk a little bit about painting best practices. And when I introduce Jim, we're going to get his major takeaways on what he learned from the painting best practice workshop. So the, um, Okay. It's double. Oh, I'm getting an echo, I guess. So let me, excuse me. See if I can clear that. Okay. Hopefully that cleared. I was getting a little bit of echo. Hopefully that cleared it. We'll see. Anyway, the um, Penny Best Practices workshop we started in 2013 not to teach people how to paint and draw. We le that's obviously left to, uh, uh, to the uh, teachers like, uh, like Jim's Robinson. So um, painting best practices helps artists understand the materials and the, and the processes that result in uh, better craft, crafted paintings, paintings that uh, have better longevity, Paintings like we see uh, in our museums today by old masters, where they uh, they clearly understood the materials and the processes they were using in order to make these paintings. So uh, the, the choices that artists make in their materials and, and practices um, will um, uh, will help um, will help them make better choices and better decisions. And I'm sorry, I'm just trying to look at some of the monitor here and, and uh, there was some issue with, uh, with the sound. So, but some of you say it's okay, so great, we'll continue on. So the, um, these choices that artists make are very important because they, they then determine, of course, the outcome of many of the paintings that we, we see. And so uh, we're going to, I'm going to introduce now uh, James Robinson, who is the founder of the Art Academy of this course back in 2017 as it was a, 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 a three-day workshop. Of course, after the COVID pandemic, we decided to uh, move from a three-day workshop into a, an online format. So some of you are already familiar with the paintingbestpractices.com, uh, where we have the entire co workshop course now as a webinar over a period of about 18 hours. Uh, with additional questions and answers from a recording uh, of a live webinar. We plan to also uh, uh, do another live webinar sometime this fall, probably perhaps September or October. So let's begin with, um, uh, with Jim, and I'm going to introduce him now. Welcome, Jim, and uh, to, uh, to our discussion here. I want to thank you for, for joining us. Oops. And we seem to have lost Jim. <laughs> Wait till Jim comes back. There he is. Okay. Great. All right. All right. You're Thanks. back with us, Jim. Um, so, I, Jim, what were the major takeaways from, uh, from what you learned at the Painting Best Practices Workshop? that you were able to use uh, in your in your teaching. Yeah, you know, I don't... Jim, we have I don't, a little problem with your sound. <clears throat> How's that going? So, I get no sound. Can you hear me now? Still no sound, Jim. Oh, you apparently you're, you're muted. You got your mic off. How's this? Okay. Great. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Jeff. You're, you're there. Yeah. Right when you started, um, I lost the connection. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so yeah, we got your sound now. 
Yeah, um, I'm 61, and I don't really think people of a younger generation realize what natural pigments has done for us. Um, I remember when I was an illustrator in the 1980s, I wanted to save time on an illustration project by doing an underpainting in acrylics and then glaze oil on top of it. So I called four paint manufacturers, the four leading manufacturers of acrylics at that time, to ask them how I could do this and if it was archival in any way. And I received four different answers. And it was such a frustrating situation um, to really try and take ser uh, painting seriously in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even the early 2000s. And then when George and Tatiana formed Natural Pigments, it would, it's really the first place where an artist can call up and get very accurate information about how to create an archival piece. And, you know, it's easy to take the science out of the painting by saying, okay, you learn this and then you go and you do a project. But what's really important, and one of the things I'm going to be talking about is that in the past, the science and the project were intimately intertwined. And um, the project dictated how the, the, the process would be performed, and the process had to create a product that was completely archival. Otherwise, the guilds would not accept the picture, and the, the studios would actually be penalized for it. They would be fined, and it would destroy their reputation. So the Painting Best Practices Workshop was really an eye-opener. Um, it, it provided me with the first practical understanding and introduction to a company who was really trying to take the art of painting, the construction of a painting, seriously. It, it, really, it really changed my life. Well, great. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, and you've been able to utilize some of these ideas in your in your teaching. Is that is that correct? Pass that yeah, on to one, students. Yeah. One of the things that that um, I'm going to be showing today is how how through this project that we worked on um, that Fina and I worked on her her self portrait and and with your encouragement and help we were able to tie all these different ends together. And, um, and I really think that learning how to paint well from a technical standpoint cuts down the number of projects that you need to do be, to become a proficient painter. Right, right. Great, well, thank you very much for that. Now, uh, Jim, you've prepared a, um, a presentation here and I think if you share your screen, I can put that on there, and and then you can um, you can present this information and, and uh, this information about the project that you and Fina worked on, and uh, as well as your school. Great, thank you so much. Let me know when you got that. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Great. So I entitled this, um, this presentation Embracing Apprenticeship because I really think neat people have a general misinterpretation of what a, an apprenticeship was and how that affects teaching and learning. Um, so we're, we're going to get rolling here. Um, Um, Fina painted this uh, portrait of her at 13, her self-portrait. It was the first self-portrait she ever painted. Um, it recently won second place at the Oil Painters of America 30th National Exhibition and was um, exhibited in California. 
we painted it exclusively with natural pigments products. It was done on an artifacts, lead primed, extra fine linen, all, all in panel uh, 532. And um, we use exclusively Rubilov oil paints and mediums. Now, who's Fina? You know, um, Fina's had a lot of recognition. She's, I've known Fina since she was about five years old. And um, she received her first portrait commission when she was 15. In this picture, you can see her holding that, that commission. It's, unfortunately, this photo is really dark and you can't see the lustrous color on this little girl's face. Um, she's gone to the Florence Academy on scholarship. She's been at the FACE, the Figured Art Convention on scholarship. There she gave a 10 minute lecture and received a standing ovation. Um, the lecture was titled The Role of Youth in the Rebirth of Figurative Art. She's been interviewed on local uh, Minnesota public radio. Um, she um, uh, donated her first portrait to a, um, a health group that works with little kids who have terminal illnesses. This was the, the portrait she did. I think she was 15 when she drew this. Really great uh, charcoal skills. And Fina is also the youngest artist representative for nit Nitrum Charcoal. If you buy a Nitrum starter kit and turn it over, there's a little biography of Fina and one of her drawings on there. Um, right before COVID hit, they flew her to Frankfurt, Germany to demonstrate their products. Fina lives in Minneapolis. And she also made a, a tutorial, how to draw an orchid for uh, Nitrum that you can watch on YouTube. Now, I think this brings up a really important question. What is Fina? Is she like an artist and crafts person or is she some girl who's really talented? And this is what we hear all the time. You know, if Fina would show her self-portrait to somebody or anything that she's done, that person will say, Fina, you are so talented, you know? And then this concept of talent can easily flow into a concept of genius. And as I say, I've known Fina forever. I don't see Fina as like this unbelievably talented person. What I see Fina as, a, as is a very focused young woman who's putting her best effort in every project and who's really decided to excel at something. And um, this concept of talent and genius really influences art today. You know, Henry Matisse is considered a genius. He's a talented genius. Harold Speed, who wrote The Practice and Science of Drawing and Oil Painting Techniques and Materials, is not considered a genius today. You know, people can tell me blue in, until they're blue in the face that Matisse is a genius and Harold Speed isn't, and I'll have a different opinion but that's what the art world's telling us. This has a lot to do with how we view the drawings and paintings by great artists like Michelangelo. If you look at the title that Art News had on this, um, this, this review of an art exhibit that was being shown, it was Michelangelo, the drawings of a genius. But if you look at the ages that he was doing this, it really should have read Michelangelo drawings from his apprenticeship. I really started getting interested in this years and years ago in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And I came across a book that was put out by Art News and it was called The Academy. Look at the subtitle of this, Five Centuries of Grandeur and Misery from the Karachi to Mao Zedong. There's an agenda when you have a subtitle like that. Let's see what that agenda is. 
It says the Florentine Academy was like Plato's. This strong anti-guild, anti-craft, anti-medieval direction became the politics of the academy for four centuries. Thus, the schools, which started in the 16th century and multiplied in the 17th century in Italy, France, and Central Europe, named themselves academies as a sign of the modernity of their approach and the, their opposition to the guild's cumbersome regulations, apprenticeships, and, and monopolistic practices. I, I wondered when I read that in that book uh, several decades ago, if that was actually true. You know, we look at Michelangelo and he really is a superhero. Here's a conservator reaching out to touch his David. We, if we look at the Sistine ceiling, you know, from a distance, gosh, that's so impressive. Four years commitment to do that. How did he do it? But then when we look at a close up with conservators, look at the size of these figures. He truly was a superhero. There's no doubt about that. He truly was a genius. But this idea that he never had a firm apprenticeship is proven untrue when you find an early Michelangelo painting that's unfinished, where you can see stages of him developing the painting that are based on very traditional methods of paintings uh, um, and, um, and processes that go back to the early Renaissance, late Middle Ages. So I actually think this idea is a very shared misconception. The artist, uh, the American Artist Magazine called um, the Artist Handbook, the Artist Bible years ago. And I have three editions of this um, from different publications so I can cross reference them. And even today, you'll hear people say, oh, just refer to the artist's handbook. Look at this quote on glazing that Ralph Mayer has. Saucers are convenient to use. The material may also be poured into screw cap jars if desired. The consistency may vary from that of a heavy flowing syrup to that of a thin varnish body, according to preferences and requirements. Wow, so he's telling me that a gl glaze should be put on very liquid. I really disagree with that from studying traditional materials. Here's, here's him on retouching varnish. A good retouching varnish can safely be used to bring out dull spots during painting. Some areas may require more than one application. The varnish should be used until the desired effect is produced. If necessary, it may be applied again and again. There is so much information going, uh, um, misinformation going on in um, Ralph Mayer's book. It was great a couple best practices ago. Um, George got a question about Ralph Mayer's book, and he said it's a great book for as a document of art technical theory, but in terms of accuracy, it's really not an accurate book. So we end up with this idea that there's this med medieval craftsman who had all these rules and regulations, and then the Renaissance artist came around and he's working as an individual. He's this unique person and he's working kind of from his heart while there were all these restrictions on these medieval craftsmen that didn't flow into the Renaissance. I think these concepts really affect our concept of teaching. The idea of efficiency in teaching is often bypassed with these concepts. Today, in traditional drawing and painting, the prevalent idea is to attend an atelier, and that atelier will be based on a 19th century French, French model. And it's a fantastic model, there's no doubt about it. That usually starts with Charles Bard drawing uh, plates. 
And from there, it evolves into a four-year program. Um, but what I want to look at is the past reimagined from that concept. Um, this really came about because I had to do a talk a couple of years ago for an early music society, and they wanted me to talk about the exchange between early music and Van Eyck paintings. So, of course, Van Eyck's most famous painting is the Ghent altarpiece. And I started reading some books. I, I, I took a, an offbeat path on this. Um, I had read earlier Barbara Tuckman's A Distant Mirror, which kind of reimagined art, I mean, history from the 14th century. And I thought, what if I did that with this lecture that I was going to give? So instead of reading books about Van Eyck and his painting methods, his assumed painting methods, I decided to go back to the Middle Ages and read books like Art and Beauty by Umberto Eco. It was a real eye opener to me. It, and it really helped me to reevaluate the way an artist workshop was set up. We have this idea, and this is from pictures that we see of St. Luke painting. And here we have a woman that would be painting, doing this as more of a serious hobby in the Middle Ages that apprentices spent the majority of their time doing grunt work. And you can see that in the painting of the woman that behind her would be a young apprentice who's spending a lot of time grinding paint. So ArtSpace says that apprenticeship Artists entered as apprentices doing menial tasks until they proved themselves talented enough to learn the art of their masters. That's a crazy statement. They're not proving themselves to get training through their talent. That would be inconceivable at that time. The second quote, if you're a recent grad of a top MFA program, your chances are good. Although these days you're more likely than not to end up as an unpaid intern, which really isn't bad. Just think of it as the contemporary parallel of an apprenticeship in a Renaissance Bottega. That paragraph is also very misleading. An unpaid internship today has no correlation to what was going on for an apprentice in a Renaissance Bottega. So what was a Renaissance or late medieval uh, artist's workshop like? It was a small business. Up front, you had people dealing with sales. They were trying to sell the goods. And these goods could really vary. Someone could come by and say, I need a, a tavern sign painted. I need my house painted. It could, um, there's a festival coming up and I need a banner for my booth. It could be anything that had to do with drawing and painting. Then there was the Bottega and that was the workroom. And it was a very crowded place where people were doing a variety of different tasks. It was like a mini factory. And then there was the studiolo, and that's where the master could disappear into a room and contemplate issues of design and, you know, work on the finances, running things. Um, here's a, an engraving by Durer of St. Jerome in his study. I thought it was very fitting for this idea of a room of contemplation that would accompany the Bottega. But that's the ideal. The reality was the studio was very lively with a lot of interruptions. Here's, here you have an artist with all his models taking a break. And so um, you're having visitors come into the studio. 
um, or the Bottega. And the other thing that we really fail to understand is how much family flowed into these, these Bottegas. Often the building that the master was in and his and where he lived were the same buildings. So his family was coming and going. Here the kids are, 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 are had their sleeping quarters in a little area of a studio. And you can see um, the master and the mom outside with the kids. So there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of interruptions in this Bottega studio space. So the apprentice comes along, the dad and the mom come with the, the young child and they say, okay, um, I want you to teach my child how to draw and paint. And we think of this as a very one-sided contract. But if you look at a contract, you can see that it's cut in the middle. So what these documents were is the same thing was written on two sides of the document. Then the document was cut in half in a, in a uh, zig, zigzag way. If the zigzags perfectly met up, they knew it was from the same contract. Also, the parties would take the contract to a lawyer in town who would copy the contract. So they would have actually a third and fourth copy of the contracts. Now, this was really interesting when I found this out because I thought this was a one-sided obligation where the parents are turning over the child and they have to pay the master a certain amount of money for training. But it was really a two-sided obligation if the master, by the end of the training, had not trained their son well enough to support a family, the guild would step in and that master would have to return all the money for all the years of training. So the expectation of teaching was enormous. The other thing that this comes to uh, brings to mind is that we have this idea that um, apprentices were like Leonardo and Michelangelo. They weren't. They were everyday normal kids of average ability, not exceptional ability, whose parents had decided that this was going to be a good trade for them. So this idea again that we have that talent would dictate how a, an apprentice would advance in terms of a studio is completely erroneous. The master had to figure, figure out a very efficient way to teach, stick to that with all the apprentices, whether they had ability or not. So how did the workshop function? Well, the um, the um, workshop was composed of people at all different levels of training and the master. And so if you look in the lower right, you'll see a boy copying from life. And if you look in the, I mean, excuse me, in the lower left, you'll see a boy copying a bus from life. And if you look in the lower left, you can see a boy drawing on a tablet. What that boy is drawing is a series of eyes. He's learning how to draw eyes. And what's not shown in there is that there would be an older person, usually an artist who was past his prime, who was teaching the apprentices. This was an early form of a guaranteed retirement plan for an older artist. He could mentor young students and still receive an income. But there is a myth about that picture, and that has to do with the series of eyes. The idea that artists were working from plates that early as, say, Cennino, um, around 1400 is inaccurate. The first 
plates were produced around, 50, around 1508. So before that, there were different drawing systems in place. Um, the activities at a drawing, at, at a, at a, in terms of drawing, went well into the night. So these apprentices were working from dawn way past dusk. They were staying up late at night to perfect their drawing skills. And if you look at this little engraving, it's really interesting because if you look at the ages of the people in this, you've got people who are being shown who you would see as teenagers, but there's also one kid in there who's really small, um, really tiny. These apprentices could be as young as age nine. You know, when we, we think of apprenticeship, we often think that these apprentices were like 13 and 14. No, they were starting at a very young age. This leads into a concept of um, practice makes perfect. Um, the motto practice makes perfect comes into being around 1550. Before that, that phrase, no reference to that phrase can really be found. And um, two things are being expressed in that phrase. Experience is the best teacher and repetition is the mother of study and learning. This phrase comes at a really interesting time in art history. In Rome, the studio systems had started to deteriorate. Rome had been sacked. It was being rebuilt. Young people were going to Rome and in the rebuilding of Rome, there were ghettos of artists who were looking for work and training. The studio system had deteriorated completely. It was a work for hire situation. Young kids were arriving there thinking they were going to get apprenticeship, but what was happening is they were running errands or doing the grunt work, grinding paint and things like that. And they would be hired for a day or two. And then they would have to go out and find another studio to work for. And in this drawing, you can see that an apprentice, what was being called an apprentice at the time, was really often on his own. He would have to draw at night. He would have to pick up drawing on his own. So this idea of practice makes perfect comes about when a teacher, the master of the, the studio could say to the apprentice, I'm not responsible for your drawing, grind the paint. What you have to do is practice drawing. Practice makes perfect. <clears throat> so these are some of the things I've talked about and it really flows into this idea that is so current today that you need to put in 10,000 hours to become proficient at something. And Edgar Payne even um, encourages this. Learning the art of painting is not an easy task. It takes a great deal of intelligence, keen analysis, study, and practice. What's not mentioned there is it takes a responsible, good teacher. That's what's being eliminated. And I love this quote by Michael Jordan. You can practice shooting eight hours a day, but if your technique is wrong, and all, then all you become is, a, is very good at shooting the wrong way. Get the fundamentals down and the level of everything you do will rise. The quote before practice makes perfect was use makes mastery. To me, that's a very different phrase. What it entails is a master saying to an apprentice, look, I will show you how to use these products. And after you use these products, you will become a master by using them. And we have commissions here that need to be fulfilled. 
I expect good drawing and good painting by the end of the week. Those were the kind of demands that were going on in those bottegas at the time of the early Renaissance, throughout the Renaissance until the system started breaking apart. So there's often a, a question today, what's more important, the process or the product? With use makes, ma with use makes mastery, the product determines the process. If you're doing an oil painting, you would follow a certain process. And the process that you followed, if you did it correctly, it equaled an archival product. So taking all these things into account, how should a student start, line or mass? Well, we know because they're drawing on tablets and paper, with styluses, they should start in line. So let's look at line. Here are some examples of Renaissance drawings by Leonardo. I love this. He's got a great rearing horse, and then he's got a great caricature. Not every drawing at every stage of your career has to be serious. Now let's look at first drawings that were done at the Art Academy of St. Paul. Alec was 11. Paige was 12 when she drew this. Angela was 13 when she drew her eye. Owl, Betta was 13. Alex was 14. Sophia was 14. Alice was 14 when she did this drawing. Now, some people would say, oh, Alice is more talented. I really disagree with that. She's just starting at a different place than than some people. I don't, I have no idea where Alice is going to end up compared to the other kids who have just started the drawing and who are following our program. Now let's look at mass. Um, today, universally in most schools, mass has to do with charcoal drawing. But if you look at the past, that is also a question. If you look at early Raphael or Albert Durer, what they're doing a lot of is pen and ink with wash. And of course, Albert Durer is the first great watercolorist of all time. So it's from these projects that we take our key. Here's an early watercolor by Ellie an early watercolor by Ellen. Ellie's 11 when she did this. Ellie's 13. Aiden's 13 when he did his tiger. Cheryl's 13 when she did her parrot. Micah did this stunning watercolor at 13. Madison was 15 when she did her rabbit, and Madison was 15 when she did her first landscape in watercolor. Here's a close-up of Madison's watercolor because it, it's just so beautiful in the color and technique. It's great. You know, here are some more um, by various kids. Just a, a stunning watercolor by Alice. You know, Allison, maybe she's done three, three or at most four other watercolors in her whole, whole life, and she's doing this. This beautiful one by Hannah. Again, Maybe three watercolors, maybe four before doing this. This feeds into expectations for a first oil painting. This is Leonardo's first oil painting. This is right out of the gate. He may have had a little instruction before this, but the expectations were that you're going to do a great oil painting that can be sold as a studio original. So here are first oil paintings at our school. Jenna had never oil painted before when she did this impressionist painting. And Ellie had never done oil painting before she had done this painting. So now let's see how this all ties into Fina's self-portrait. I got the idea from Fina's self-portrait because I looked at early self-portraits that students were doing at different ages. The most important one is always Albert Durer's self-portrait that he drew in Silver Point at age 13. And Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema's self 
portrait that he did in oil at age 16. You know, I thought, my gosh, if Albert Durer could do that at 13, and Al Matanema could do that at 16, I bet Fina could do that at 13 and 16. Why not? So the first thing we did was started with a charcoal self-portrait. Fina learned charcoal by doing this copy. She did this one copy, and she had been playing around with charcoal a little before that, but this is where she really learned how to push finish to uh, something in, to finish in charcoal. And then she did the self-portrait. The one preceded the other. She finished this at age 13. Um, one thing that's really encouraged at our school is no measuring. This whole preoccupation with measuring that's going on with, at schools, we really avoid. If you look here, this is the um, third or fourth um, figure drawing that Fina ever did from life. It's just a beautiful figure drawing. Um, and her start, you can see that Fina's been taught how to do basically visual pinball. She's just bouncing around, looking for big angles, doing as little measuring, if any, as possible. And here Fina is, um, this um, accompanied her NPR interview, showing off um, her first um, really involved copy, and then her finished self-portrait when um, she was 13. And this was taken at our school. Okay, the next thing I wanted Fina to learn was underpainting, Bister Grisai. So here's her Bister Grisai underpainting. She would have done this at age 14. And to do that, she, she took her drawing and she did a wet transfer. And here you can see Fina um, working really efficiently with her paint, laying in her undercoat um, in a brushy manner and then working into it. So she's putting down her, her um, bister very loose and then working in, in with her grisaille very sensibly. Really great paint handling. And this was really the opportunity where Fina and I started taking natural pigments products and really analyzing them. We did this together, um, testing out all their different products. Now we get into her color self-portrait. Fina started her color self-portrait after she had finished her grisaille when she was um, um, close to her 15th birthday and she fi finished it when she was age 16. Here are the steps and principles that Fina followed when she did this. As I've mentioned, this was done on an Artifex Lead Prime Extra Fine Linen Panel, number 532. She transferred her, draw her drawing using a wet transfer technique. Um, then she covered the drawing um, with a mixture of bone black, underpainting white, and Rublov's transparent base. It was used as a ground to take that transferred drawing and lighten the transfer line. She did an abbreviated underpainting in natural pigments, Rublov's Cyrus Umber Light, Cyprus Under. Uh, uh, underpainting light. And then Fina and I spent a lot of time researching William Bouguereau's painting methods. Um, I emailed George and asked him to give me an equivalent to natural pigments, um, Rublov colors that were equivalent to Bouguereau's colors. And this is what he supplied me with. So we took that and Fina started doing a color chart. There's her color chart of the primary mixes. 
And then we decided that she was going to use oleo gel as a medium. Most importantly, this was done in three rounds from start to finish. There was no chasing and there was no backtracking in the painting. She did not get lost in the middle of the painting. Very rarely did she have to ask me what to do next. And here you can see Fina mixing up some of her um, flesh tone mixes. Um, you can see by the size of the brushes that she was towards the end of the painting process. This was in her final round. And here you can see the painting um, under raking light um, before it was varnished. Just a really fantastic self-portrait. And you know, like I say, Fina has only painted one other figure up until this point. And that was that commissioned uh, self um, commissioned portrait of a little girl. She, she paid this really um, nice tribute to me. Um, lately, I have been spending my time at the Art Academy of St. Paul working with natural pigments paints. To get a similar configuration to Boudreaux's palettes, I have made a color chart to refer to. Now I have started to apply a thin layer of color values onto my underpainting. I began slowly, but I understand this method. I am progressing much faster and it is becoming more and more fun. Um, then, you know, she did a charcoal tribute to her mom, um, celebrating the day that mom her mom sent her off to um, kindergarten. And then she painted a tribute to her great grandmother. Now this was a different kind of project using natural pigments paints. And here we, I wanted Fina to do this a la prima. So this was all done in one painting round. To do that, I took all my natural pigments paints and recorded their drawing time. And what I found is that the cadmium colors stayed very wet for the longest time. So then Fina did a warm up with her new uh, uh, palette of cadmium colors with some other colors added that were also um, slow drying. She did this butterfly in I think two hours. And whoops. And then she finished her painting. These, these methods hold true for adult art instruction too. Ben King's a student of mine online. This is the first underpainting he's ever done. Here are his samples of Rubilov colors to figure out Bouguereau's palette. Here's his first color study that he's under, ever done. Bob Upton, who's a local landscape artist, um, he did this a la prima. He's come to me to learn traditional techniques. Here he's doing an on, um, underpainting and overpainting. Another one, this is from an article that was in um, Plain Air Magazine on Bob. And here you can see he's do a, doing a, a Bonington copy to learn underpainting techniques and how they can affect his painting. And in this um, a la prima study that Bob did, you can see in the rocks up the top how it's full of underpainting. Um, I did want to mention Jeff Larson before I go. Um, the Great Lakes Academy of Art. Um, yeah, um, we've been really fortunate that we've set up our kids program. Um, at the Great Lakes Academy. Jeff asked us to do that. And it's a school I really believe in. Jeff's really doing great work up there. And we have three students now who are in their full-time program. And here's our contact information. So that's our presentation. Go Turning it over to you, George. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, let me. Okay. And 
All right. So we've uh, I've I put Fiend on the screen, um, and um, and if you have any questions, uh, at, by the way, that was uh, uh, Jim. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. I I uh, really appreciate the points uh, uh, in in my study of uh, of these uh, studio workshops. Of course, I was focusing on the materials and what they were doing with that, and also how artists learned these materials um, because they had they had uh, so much contact with part of that uh, paint making process um, and uh, but obviously the focus was always on their drawing and uh, paint working as an apprenticeship in painting so it's it's really remarkable to see that but um, and we like to we like to emphasize how important it is, like how uh, what you did with Fina in working out drying properties, color you know color mixes, those kinds of things. Uh, I know a lot of artists aren't doing, which is really important to understand. You know how does paint dry, and um, uh, how does that go into the piece that you're working in, and and uh, makes a huge difference. So they're not really cognizant of that, and there's lots of choices there. Yeah, and it cuts down on on the number of projects that you need to do to become proficient. That's the amazing thing. That's that's the amazing thing that that both Fina and I have discovered. It's not mm -hmm. like she needed to do hundreds of portraits before she did a great one. Yeah, Fina, what was your uh, your take on on learning about? Um, about colors in that way. It's, it's really kind of a, an, an, an extra way of learning about like the drawing time and drawing time, drawing time, excuse me, of, of these paints. Definitely. Yeah, and yeah. so I started off when I first started, well, I think I was around the age of nine. Mm -hmm. So I already kind of had a like, preliminary knowledge of mixing up color values and things like that through mm -hmm. obviously Jim's program. But uh, yeah, Jim helped me definitely introduce this kind of new aspect of making sure your paints stick around and things that are um, I often didn't think about before, like when I first started painting. So yes, it definitely took an extra um, bit of patience to kind of go through all of this. But in the end, I really created something that that glowed and it looked real. And in the end, it was so worth it to me to kind of gain this knowledge and work with both George, your products and Jim as well. Great. So what do, you, what do you, what more can you say about that, Jim? And, you know, um, one of the things that we, um, I think in, in uh, teaching art today, especially in, in the big institutes, um, of course, there's, there seems to be a de-emphasis. It's start, starting to be a change. We're seeing this. Um, there's, but there's been such a large de-emphasis on craftsmanship or learning um, learning how to do things and, and, and obviously the apprentice, you know, how the apprenticeship programs worked in the, um, uh, medieval period and the Renaissance. Um, what would you, you know, how, how does that, um, how do you work with that, uh, and counter some of those things you know, today? Yeah, I, I really think this just keeps coming back to this this concept that we have at our school is that like every kid who comes in is talented and if we have that belief um, it puts a lot of pressure on us because we expect within the first drawing to show that talent and so it's really made us reevaluate how to teach people how to draw and paint well because we can't we can't spend a lot of time, you know, doing multiple projects. What one of the things is that um, um, th there are a lot of books that are being put out, like do these drawing lessons, and you don't need to do a lot of drawing lessons. You should start out with the idea that your first piece is going to be exceptional and hold that in your mind. And if you do that and you follow very precise, logical steps, 
your first piece can be exceptional. Yeah, and it shows up in what you're doing. I, I it, you know, there's uh, not enough credit given to teachers today, um, and what, uh, and especially if they're doing things like what you're doing there, you get obviously you're getting a lot of good results, and um, and that is absolutely amazing. I, I really hard to uh, um, comprehend why this isn't uh, done more often, and, uh, and right. I think we we can gather so much information from the past and building on that rather than just tearing it down or ignoring it. Right. The, um, um, there also very interesting too was, um, the points that you brought up about, uh, modern art textbooks, like, um, um, uh, like Ralph Mayer's textbook, which is, I know when I was going to, um, uh, to school, that's everybody was handed that book and, that that's true that quote you said uh, it was considered to be the bible but as we found um it's a good snapshot of that period of time but certainly uh we can't really rely on it today because it's so uh it, it is just so stuck in that that period of time mid-century mid uh 20th century um right so what what uh, are you using any, you, you mentioned a few things you're using some texts or uh, do you use do you draw upon any uh uh, you, of course, you you showed the the bark um, uh, drawings from from the French Academy. Right. The main thing that I do is I'm I'm an art history fanatic, so I'm always reading an art history book, and I'm I would say that instead of reading, say the Barg Jerome book, um, drawing book, the Charles Barg book. Um, I would be reading more things like the National Gallery Technical Bulletins because I, I get more insight into, into those types of books. Um, and what's really exciting about art history right now is that there are people who are coming along and saying, hey, wait a minute, let's reevaluate how we perceive a studio to be. Maybe it's not like what what we've been thinking and and coming across some of those texts have have really helped me my my two go-to books my two favorite books of all time are harold speed's two books but also solomon j solomon i read those i try and read those books every year but i'm not just reading them i'm outlining them because i really feel that those two books are the standard that we should be having. They have so much insight into how to train people efficiently, but you can't read them in a superficial way. They're written in an older style of writing and, and you can go through those books and, and not really take anything in. But if you slow down and start outlining them, wow, the process is really amazing that they're trying to pass on. Great. Thanks. I just wanted to. I just wanted to say too. Sorry. Sure. Um, was. I mean, we've we've talked a lot about teaching, but. You know, after this talk, where Sarah and I, who, and Sarah Howard and I, who who own the art academy and and we're the primary teachers there, we'll be going to um, one of our kids' grad parties. Who goes to the school? Liam, who we've known, you know, since he was. I don't know, maybe eight, and he's graduating from high school. And um, one of the big things about the school, and I can say this very clearly about FINA, is, is that the relationships that we're forming with these kids mean so much to us. I mean, it's just such a joy to see FINA grow up and become the person she's becoming and to play a little part in that. So that feeds into it too. I mean, there is, there is an element of, you know, sincere love and affection that develops in this, in this long-term apprenticeship student teacher relationship that we have at the school. Great. Well, thanks very much. And, um, uh, a couple of people asked just to, for you to repeat those, uh, uh, Jeremy already posted one of the titles of Harold Speed's book, um, 
you also mentioned, just to reiterate, Solomon J. Solomon. Right. Those are all Dover reprints. You can get them as Dover reprints. So there's Solomon J. Solomon's book, um, which is um, oil painting. And then um, the Herald Speed books are The Practice and Science of Drawing. And I think the new Dover edition is Oil Painting Techniques and Materials. Right. And, and but again, you really have to study those books. Yeah. To, to yeah. get what you need out of them. Yeah. There's a question also from Derek. He says, um, great presentation. Would you suggest always um, always using always using alkyd with cadmium in blocking in modeling or just as a as a thin of paint as possible i've been using alka gel for quite a while that's what he said there well uh, the when when fina painted her this the tribute to her grandmother that was an alla prima painting we chose those cadmium colors. We chose the cadmium colors, um, Tuscan red, um, the Maya blue, um, the, the colors that dry slowly that we found through our tests that dried very slowly. Um, we used the lead white number two, um, and we used your walnut um, gel medium. And so, <clears throat> Fina never did an underpainting um, for that painting. Um, it was all one go. The, the reason that we use cadmium colors, we wanted them to be slow drying so the edge would stay wet. Mm -hmm. So when Fina finished a little section, maybe she painted an egg. Maybe that's how much time she had that day. She'd paint the egg and she would return the next day, those edges would be wet so she could fuse those edges so it would look like it was all done at once. Um, Whistler has this great quote that a painting should look like it's blown on the canvas in one breath, <laughs> you know? And, and I love that quote because he's saying, it doesn't matter how many rounds you needed to do to get there. And Whistler was, notorious for, for taking like 50 sittings to, to do a, a, a portrait. But in the end, it looked, it had to look like it was done at once. And so that's why we chose the cadmium colors because they were slow drying. When Fina did her self portrait um, and she did her underpainting, she used the Cypress Umber Light because it was a quicker drying mm -hmm. paint. And we wanted that um, underpainting to set up so she could start working on top of it. So again, the, the drying times and the paints dictate how we build a painting, just like it would have dictated how they built a painting in the Renaissance. Right. So that's very important to understand. And that's, that's a good point. Uh, choice of colors in this particular case is also how you can execute the painting, a la prima, uh, or indirect stages. So you might want to use something faster drawing for an underpainting, um, but, um, but for a la prima, could be slower drawing. So it really depends on, on so many different aspects there. So I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it really comes down to, you know, doing these two contrasting projects with Fina. It really, it really brought to light that I've chosen my company. It's natural pigments. Um, and I think that's so important to really key into one company where you know the people who are running it have true concern and integrity and you can contact them for help. I've chosen my company. I, I know all their products are great. And I can talk to the person who's ch in charge of those products, <laughs> George. Yeah. Or if I want to talk about brushes, I can talk to Tatiana. Hmm. And then I can choose the colors 
and the products and the, the mediums based on what I'm trying to do. It's a different way of thinking. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Jim and Fina, for joining us and for your time. And um, uh, we want to thank our, our audience for jo part joining with us. And um, we hope to see you at the next Painting Best Practices art Artist and Interview. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye now.